the day. Uh, the first presenter of the day, day is Mrs. D. Deepika Devi uh, from the Department of English, Assistant Professor from the Department of English, PPG College of Arts and Science, Kwamatur. And she's going to present on the topic dominating the destitutes. I'm sorry. Ma'am, sorry. Actually, Deepika Devi, uh, she informed that she couldn't join in this session, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Then who so should I start with? Yes, ma'am. Next Nishta, Nishta. Can I move to Yes, ma'am. Yes, Nishta. Okay, now let's have uh, Nishta Mahava, if I'm not pronouncing wrongly, a uh, former student from the mm -hmm. Central University of Rajasthan uh, to speak on the topic, a sexual subaltern, the gendered commercial sex workers of India. Uh, waiting to hear from you, uh, Nishita. Over to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Yeah, yes. present. Yes. Yes. Um, so very good afternoon, Chairperson, ma'am, and my fellow pre presenters. In today's conference, I'm going to talk about the lives of commercial sex workers of India through the lens of a sexual subaltern. Now, time and again, within post-colonial India, we have seen that the identity of or the lives of a sex worker is considered problematic and it is questioned because of the prevalent mainstream gender practices. So the attempt of the paper is to read the subjugation of the gender practices and sexual choices of the sex workers uh, in India. And uh, at large, the paper also attempts to understand the theory, Butler's theory of gender performance in uh, you know, to understand Butler's theory of gender performance uh, in, in the area of the sexual subjectivities that exist within the community of sex workers of India. So beginning with, uh, the paper is going to talk about sexual subalterns within post-colonial India. It is going to uh, draw inferences from Butler's theory of gender performance to understand the gender expression and sexual choices of these commercial sex workers and to read the term subjugation and marginality in terms of a sexual uh, in terms of a sex worker and to understand the subverted gender expression and sexuality of sex workers in the conventional sphere of gender practices in India. So now first and foremost, we need to understand the term sexual subaltern. So the term sexual subaltern uh, is uh, coined by Ratna Kapoor and it is a concept which is used by Ratna Kapoor. Ratna Kapoor is a feminist legal scholar and this is a term which we even uh, which we study under subaltern studies which is the theme of our conference today. So according to this term and according to the concept of a sexual subaltern Ratna Kapoor talks about the various range of sexual minorities that exist within post-colonial India. Uh, she aims to understand these sexual minorities uh, and their existence, which trouble the conventional gender practices within India. Overall, Ratna Kapoor wants to create a counter heteronormative movement and to challenge the normative assumptions that inform the lawmaking of the country. And interestingly, this term sexual subaltern do not include just the queer community within India, but it also includes the various other sexual minorities. For example, the sex workers and within sex workers also, there are various other sexual minorities that exist. So this term is not a homogeneous or a stable term, but uh, this term goes on to represent the many, many sexual identities and which exist within post-colonial India. Now, talking about Butler's theory of gender performativity or gender performance. So Butler, in this theory, she differentiates between sex, sexuality and gender. She says that these three terms are independent of each other. And Butler, to, expr uh, to explain the idea of gender, she gives the analogy of a theatrical performance and compares it to gender. 
uh, and you know the analogy of theatrical performance suggests that uh, gender identity or gender expression is a performance for example uh, when we are assigned a role to perform at a theater so we prepare accordingly to the role so in the same way what butler here wants to say is that every day in our lives we are performing our gender we are performing uh, our gender expression and gender identity so overall she want uh, she counter argues the idea that gender is a natural construct and she says that gender is a social construct that gender is a performance and she counter argues the idea that gender is binary she says that if gender is a performance that some day then someone somewhere can choose to you know add different uh, variety like add a set of different characteristics to define themselves which is completely fine so butler supports the idea of gender fluidity over gender binary and uh, which i am going to highlight more in my presentation so now know your commercial sex workers uh, uh, Ashok Alexander is an author who has closely worked with the sex workers and he has written his testimony, A Stranger Truth, in which he talks about the sex workers community, the commercial sex workers community of India. But the good thing about the book is that Ashok Alexander does not limit the talk of the commercial sex workers to the uh, women sex workers, but he goes on to talk about the various other communities that exist within the community of uh, commercial sex workers in India. So he throws light on the uh, community of TG sex workers and on MSMs that are not much talked of. And these communities are the ones which are doubly marginalized within India because of their choice of sexual um expression and gender expression now to talk about uh, tg sex workers which are the transgender sex workers so the transgender sex workers are known by the term hijra in north and by the term aravnis in south these uh, sex workers uh, sorry these transgenders they commonly uh, practice two kinds of profession one is badai and the other is biku badai is the one in which transgenders go to the houses of people on celebratory occasions to give them blessings and biku is the profession in which they collect arms so biku also involves participating in sex trade and hence uh, here comes the community of TG sex workers. So there are two types of TG sex workers. One is the aqua, which are the non-emasculated ones, which do not undergo uh, the chain, uh, you know, the sex operation chain. Uh, they do not uh, undergo the sex change operation. And the nirvanas are the ones which are emasculated. And because they are emasculated, so they are highly prized in the sex trade. And then talking about uh, MSM. So MSM is an acronym for male with male sex. These are the doubly marginalized community within sex work because of fair reasons that homosexuality till date is uh, not encouraged in our country. And it is an umbrella term for a variety of sexual exchanges. So within MSMs also, there are a category of sexual subjectivities that exist. For example, there are kotis, which play the feminine role in the sexual exchange. And there are panthis, which, uh, which play the uh, masculine role in the sexual exchange. Then there are double deckers, which play both the roles. And then uh, there is this term macho truck drivers this terminology which ashok alexander quoted in his book to explain the queerness or the homosexual nature of the truck drivers who often uh you know indulge into these uh, commercial uh, sexual activities so he says that they uh, indulge in these activities but uh, with the female sex workers but they are also found to uh, you know they are also found making out or having these kind of sexual exchanges with the helper boy in the truck which talks about their homosexual identities so uh, 
it is important to talk about the other in the sex trade because uh, when we whenever we talk about sex trade we talk about female prostitution so it is important to talk about the other because we need to understand that within sex work also uh, there are a lot of non heteronormative sexual identities that exist and that are doubly marginalized because they are not you know talked of talked of and uh, these in their narratives like if you read narratives of these non heteronormative uh, sexual identities you will feel that they uh, you know they face a lot of identity crisis that identity crisis is a recurring theme in their life narratives because uh, like in ashok alexander's book also he has talked about many msm sex workers who you know live a very conventional lifestyle like they are married they have children but uh, they would practice this trade or their uh, real sexual identity in secret so then it is important to talk about these sexual identities and then the uh, these sexual identities they also lack support from family society or police like it is found out that many gay rape victims they do not report the crime then queer is just not limited to the lgbt this is one important thing that i want to highlight that it is just not limited to the lgbt or the queer community but it defines the non conventional behavior thinking and sexual expression within the within post colonial india so i would here i would like to conclude my paper and say that the paper attempts to read the gender lives of commercial sex workers as a sexual subaltern in post colonial india and to view sexual subjectivities of sex workers as a discourse of academia and by studying the relevance of butler's gender performativity in gender and sexual expression of commercial sex workers in india the aim is to theorize and in the process materialize the gender choices of sex workers thank you thank you um nishta that was a clear dissection of sexual subjectivity and you made some great points to meet and portray a closeness to queer theory and also to lgbtq that's a nice presentation and you had a different form of reference is also and i'm also able to learn many uh, subdivisions as far as these sexual subjectivity are considered i have a question for you um yes. when we come to when you come to address the sexual subalterns do you believe in all these gays lesbians and sex workers a more challenging and more dominant as far as um culturally uh, considered like are we look are we looking at them with the same stand or are we looking at them in the same point of view like are, are they all on the same line when we talk about these lesbians gays um and when you started um your presentation you were narrowing it down uh, to a group of sex workers do you think they are more prominently seen are all being put together into this line ma'am uh, define it at large i feel that uh, all these uh, communities or sexual identities that i mentioned in my paper they all exist within the same line presently because uh, they are in gen in general they are not accepted in the mainstream uh, you know society and the mainstream ideas of gender expression are the ones that hinder their existence be it the existence of a commercial sex worker or you know the lgbtq so i feel that yes like all of them are then the same here okay so when it comes to legal arena okay yes, when it comes to legal arena um is there any possibilities for these people to also normalize their life in a country like india 
Hmm. Hmm, that is uh, difficult and a lot of research, legal research is going for it. And um, I wouldn't say that it is impossible because a lot like Ratna Kapoor herself, she is a legal feminist scholar and her theories do affect the uh, law making like this is her agenda that she wants her theories and her uh, academic theorization to affect the law making of the country at large okay. so with all the ongoing talk that is happening around with you know around uh, sex workers or yeah. the right of the queer community and all of that so there is definitely there's hope that some thing might happen in the legal area as yeah. well some okay. positive change. yes yes but in general pleasure and desire you know we are all mere human beings and it's common to all okay when it comes to pleasure when it comes to desire no it has become an important um uh role to for every human being to have their own feelings and all that but when you talk about this in a post-colonial context and that too in the field of literature, we obviously see through all these things, I mean, all these topics coming again and again through these LGBTQ cure theories and you know, subaltern literature. And of course, you have seen it in a different point of view, like um, this is not something common to talk. I mean, uh, it's not something closely related to literature, but you stepped out of literature and you have presented your paper well. And I appreciate and congratulate you uh, for having um, displayed a different view as far as um, gender commercial sex workers of India is considered. And I wish you all the best in your future also to take up topics that speak differently because we would like to hear more because the world is becoming more competitive. Um, thank you, Nishta, for your presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable inputs. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to call upon um, assistant professors, uh, Dr. S. Lata Rani and Ms. Prinsi from the college MNSSVM Madurai and other teacher from St. Anthony's College, Dindakal, to present your papers on Dalit women, a minority within a minority. Please, uh, professors. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Prince. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, from St. Anthony's College, Syndical. And uh, today I'm going to present the paper on Dalit women, a minority within a minority. Uh, shall I share my screen, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Please. Yeah. So my topic is Dalit women, a minority within a minority. So in India, uh, we actually, everyone was uh, determined by their uh, caste. Actually, the social status, which is determined through the caste. Uh, Dalit women, uh, commonly Dalit people, are um, mostly uh, considered as uh, uh, low grade and lower uh, people and particularly here i'm going to talk about uh, dalit women and in india uh, for uh, centuries dalit women are uh, living in a silent manner uh, they are uh, actually suppressed and oppressed by everyone um, they are acted as a mute mute uh, spectators they are not allowed to talk anymore uh, they are never uh, allowed to talk about their suppressed, uh, oppressed, which is happening and which is faced inside their home, inside their inside uh, their community people. Uh, this is what happening to the uh, Dalit women, and um, most of the common uh, oppression against them is um, uh, based on mental and physical torture, sexual harassment. And uh, they felt uh, very insecure, even in uh, society as well as in the family too. They are uh, uh, treated very badly. 
um and um, dalit women are mostly uh, suffering across the generation in the, the, that is what's happening every day they face so many problems but uh, they never allowed to talk outside they are uh, always considered as a voiceless people actually and um, um here i have mentioned one thing that um, they are uh, bear the triple uh, burden of denial they are uh, suppressed in caste gender as well as uh, in a poverty because they are always depend on men already these uh, women are uh, uh, suppressed because of their caste in society and these people are always uh, uh suffered inside their home inside by their own uh, um minority people that's why i mentioned here dalit women are uh, minority among uh, minority because uh, they are doubly marginalized uh like a black women and um, dalit women are uh, stand at the lowest most level of the society because they face uh, multiple problems inside the home as well as outside the home and um economically they were suppressed sexually they were abused uh, by the upper caste men as well as uh, their own community men um and uh, not only men but also the high caste women also suppressed and oppressed and ill treated the dalit women even the women in upper caste also suppressed the dalit women and uh, here i have one out of three uh, writers baby kamli uh, umila power and bama and here uh, baby kamli's autobiography the present we grow which is um, always confirm that one dalit women in 10 used to die during the childbirth due to lack of awareness medical help and uh, some such species believe like that and uh, one woman among 100 used to harm by husband or by their in-laws this was uh, clearly mentioned in that uh, autobiography the prison we broke and uh, bama also described the many dalit women or tortured to death by their husband and um, uh, she also mentioned that uh, they are uh, very much ill treated by their own community men and the uh, women of ours the weave of my life uh, which is a very good book and uh, that uh, women of power says that the um uh, can i hear my voice ma'am yes ma'am we can hear you yes ma'am women of power says that the dalit men regret for equal rights and they uh, uh but they behave inside uh, uh in a home which is a uh, totally different because they are uh, longing for the rights and everything but inside the home they have uh, totally suppressed the dalit women this is what happening and these autobiography is mentioned that how this uh, women are treated particularly dalit women are treated among the dalits and uh, because they are tries alienated on the ba- basis of uh, caste class and gender and uh, their problems mainly there is a lack of education early marriage and health problems these are all the things which is faced by the dalit women and um, particularly uh, they are uh, uh, very much sexually abused by the upper caste men this is what happening but no one is uh, raising the question about against the upper caste men even uh, even their husbands and everyone because uh, they never talk against uh, the upper class men in urmila babas the weave of my life uh, is a very good uh, autobiography in marathi she described a difficulty in the education system and uh, caste norms language culture and everything um she also discussed about the internal patriarchy Uh, which makes dalit women victim of patriarchal control by the dalit dalit men and physical abuse and also the economic 
explanations. And uh, one more incident I just want to chat with you that um, in um, Maharashtra, the district of Maharashtra, you knew that uh, two Dalit women were slippered and uh, become naked in the village just because their shadow had fallen on the wealth. Uh, this was very ridiculous. We are not able to hear this type of uh, news, actually. Once we heard that our blood boiled on uh, reading about this type of uh, news. This is what happening uh, to every um, Dalit woman. Even though in this era, everyone is uh, educated and uh, everyone in a good position. Okay, but many young Dalit women have had to stop using social media out of fear and because the abuse had reached the intolerance level. This is what happening here. Even uh, we can um, we can also uh, compare that uh, Brahmin women, upper caste women with uh, uh, Dalit women. Uh, we can consider that Brahmin women also suppressed uh, by their own community, but uh, they never uh, suppressed in the society. They never uh, faces any uh, uh, cruel things in the society. But uh, Dalit women are uh, mostly face these type of uh, uh, cruelty among their own community as well as uh, uh, from the outside of the society as well. This is what uh, happening to them. And um, we also uh, read uh, that... Um, Dalit women uh, known as uh, untouchable, we all know that. But this is what strictly ranked, ranked the based one. This is what happening today itself. Uh, even though they are educated, this is what happening. Injustice directed at the uh, uh, Dalit women causes profound trauma and suffering uh, across the generation. And uh, they are deeply embedded discrimination from the birth. And they are remanded at the act and mute. Actually, I, I have mentioned this, that uh, they are acted as a mute sub spectator to their exploitation. And they are, uh, they are just sacrifice everything. And they, they are facing this uh, barbarity every day. This is what happening. Uh, this is what happening to them. I just want to conclude my uh, uh, Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, yes, yes, we are hearing yes. to you. Yes, yes. I just yes. want to conclude my presentation with the quotes. There is only caste that the caste of humanity. Uh, we have to go through it and. Uh, the education is the only thing which is going to change this uh, situation. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. But uh, um, as far as these Dalit women are considered, now I just had two general questions to ask you because now every every then and there, here and there, now we always hear about the, the word Dalit. But do you think, uh, ma'am, that the picture of these Dalit women, okay, like only women, why not men? Everywhere people talk only about women. They don't concentrate on children. They don't concentrate on men. They don't concentrate on the whole community. Do you think the picture of Dalit women alone is differently seen in rural and urban areas? If you say so, yes, in what way, ma'am? Uh, uh, Dalit is a common thing. It's not uh, 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 It's not separated to men and women. But my point of view is the women, they're uh, doubly marginalized, not only from in the rural area, as well as uh, from city side also. Uh, even the educated uh, people are trying to hide the suppression and everything, the caste and everything, but they are facing something uh, regarding the caste. 
I but even in a see, ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I also feel like there are also men who are equally being. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, there ma are men also who are equally being. There are also children who are equally being. Yeah, they target yeah, just that only word marginalized. Or that yeah, ma'am. That's it's right. Not only women is what I feel, Prince Ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's <laughs> right. Only that's what uh, I meant. That uh, Dalit is common for uh, uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. But my topic is that uh, we have to focus on women. Why they are uh, suppressed inside the house as well as in the society also. No, ma'am. That's what mm -hmm. uh, you know. Then. So the main focus we have to. Uh, because they are influenced on their child, no, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, I have one more question for you. Um, yes, it is always considered that these marginalized people are uncivilized, impure, and inferior, and all that. How could they have a social identity if they are always treated like this, ma'am? Like being, they are always considered to be uncivilized, impure, and inferior. And this is, you know, this circulates like, a, you know, um, something deeply to think about. So, how could they have a social identity, though being more oppressed or uncivilized, impure, and inferior, ma'am? In your point of view, can I have a general answer, ma'am? Uh, social metrics are not missed in uh, far way, ma'am. Okay. That is what I'm thinking. Ma'am, can you come again, please? Social metrics are not missed in uh, far way, ma'am. Okay. Measured, uh, not measured in a far way, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you expect it to be more fair? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, because you know, whenever we talk about them, we always look at them as they are you no know, uncivilized and they are not. So we, are, or... we are never, they are not uncivilized, uh, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And they are always from an inferior point of view. And I always wonder is that these reasons or these points or these uh, words that make them us, um, that make us to speak more about them. Are we all trying to give an identification to them because they are all uncivilized? Right, ma'am. Right, right. It's about the social metrics, uh, which gives us a lot of wonder. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, uh, I mean, uh, the role of Dalit woman, why she's been considered to be a minority within minority. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, next, Ultra, ma yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I think Manaka Devi also not there in the meeting, ma'am. Actually, she is also unable to attend the presentation session, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's all, ma'am. We'll wind up the session, ma'am. Oh, thank, thank you so you much, so ma'am. Ma um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, the whole team of AVP College of Arts and Science, you all have done a good, great job. It's indeed a different frame of uh, standpoints and references from the two presenters. We are able to hear uh, from them this art that what exactly is a Bolton is. And both of them had a, um, 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 what to say, a different uh, perception of understanding what exactly Dalit is all about and it's a role in literature. Thank you, Maha, ma'am. Thank you, the whole team. Thank of you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for us. spending your valuable time with us. Ma'am, always. This is always the time is valuable being here with you people. Yes, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, she is going good. to present her paper on the title. Bhakti yes. Shidba and Arindadira is challenging and redefining the stereotypal beliefs of sexual identity and formative roles. Well, ma'am, we can proceed. OK, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to present my paper here today. Um, I would like to know if my screen is visible. Is it visible, ma'am? 
yes it's uh, visible okay so today i am going to present the paper uh, the title is uh, bapsi sidwa and arundhati roy challenging and redefining the stereotypical beliefs of sexual identity and performative roles so i am going to discuss my favorite uh, two of my favorite writers today who always inspired me so about uh, what is my paper today bapsi sidwa and arundhati roy had their different approaches in their books regarding the issue of femininity and the formation of sexual identity they have raised questions regarding the conventional beliefs about the issue of sexual identity which are deeply rooted in our society so instead of placing the female character in extremely difficult situations and portraying them as anti male or uh, in order to address the issue of female oppression they have subtly or directly challenged the age old beliefs regarding gender identities so we don't see always that there is a clash uh, as per se between the male and the female rather it has a social reality which talks about the situations which we as female had to go through Uh, especially under different social uh, circumstances the paper tries to analyze to what extent uh, the stories have subverted the uh, stereotypical beliefs they explain that gender should not be shown in opposition to each other but in juxtaposition to each other so how this female and male they come together and form an identity or how are the different that should be the approach they have linked the ideas of community violence nationality religion and class with sexual inequality um, marital equation and intergender relations to show how patriarchy works in every aspect of life so first let's talk about uh, i have uh, just taken some of the works of sidwa and roy like the god of small things ice candy man the pakistani wife and i have tried to analyze them under the gaze of feminism so sedwa and roy both have embedded their independent women character in self expression individuality and independence and they have curved their protagonists often as uh, lost and confused which made them look human so it is not that women are flawless like they can be like uh, goddesses or something rather these women are with flaws with confusion with errors just like any human being should be so sidwa's book like ice candy man shows a plethora of women character they might be promiscuous or virtuous these women help each other to subvert patriarchy on the other hand roy's book god of small things shows often it can show jealousy between two women thus there is no fixed notion of women being savior of women or women tearing down each other identity is formed by individual uniqueness and not by societal norms of gendered behavior so there are a lot of presumptions that if you are women you should support women of you or if you are women you should always tear down women so there is no such fixed concepts of gendered behavior rather it depends on the individual so in characters like uh, zaitun in the pakistani wife or bride and sarla in water sidwa shows how domestic sphere as well as a social religious norms exploit female liberty roy in her book uh, like ministry of atmos happiness portrayed a transgender uh, person evoking an idea that sexual identity can be formed by choice both of these writers in their own ways portray the journey of women character towards their liberation So let's talk about solidarity of women amidst crisis in Ice Candy Man. So Sidwa is one of the most celebrated work, Ice Candy Man. Uh, it explores the civil war that occurred during the partition of India in 1947. So it is told from the uh, first person perspective of Lenny Sethi, a Percy child of about uh, four year old. So what Sidwa tried here is to show she wanted to show solidarity in the experiences of women through different ages and different ethnic identity. Lenny and her family attempt to hide in plain sight as the two main ethnic uh, identities i mean here religious more like religious identities hindu and muslims enter into a head on collision we find instances of violence against women through the character of aya lenny's nurse the issue of subjugation of women comes to the surface as the ice candy man who once had a cordial relationship with aya perpetrates violence on her to conform to his rational identity i mean here it is shown how uh, aya underscores how act of um, abduction and rape use women's sexuality as a tool uh, to articulate religious national enmity uh, like 
Aya's abduction can be read as a punishment for her lack of adherence to cultural norms. Then again, it highlights how women's bodies uh, were under patriarchal surveillance and regulation, and those who fail to abide by social rules will inevitably be discarded. So that is the point. Now, women of Lahore come together to save Aya despite individuality. It's organized violence against their sex that unites them all. So we have seen that there are different ethnic groups like Parsi community. But what happens? We see that at, at last Lenny's uh, mother, she like starts uh, working some illegal activities just to save her fellow women from the clutches of uh, you know the criminals so it is not their being women that brought them together but it is the atrocities that being women they had to face as a unified all which came them brought them together so uh here my point is that we women share a experience of being marginalized as a whole and it comes to the surface especially uh during the times of crisis social crisis so now uh, let's talk about breaking of stereotypes uh, regarding female sexuality in Roy's God of Small Things. So here the story revolves around the love laws that existed in 1960s Kerala. While in Sidwa, we saw women standing in solidarity due to their experiences. In this novel, we find women tearing each other apart due to their own experiences. So see, there is no fixed pattern. There is no norm of behavior, of gender behavior. It depends on individuals for some their experiences our experiences shape our perception so however the fact that their own um, will always come subservient to the patriarchal overarching influence in socio-cultural scenario is quite clear so uh, they doesn't matter if they support each other or they tear each other down the fact that all the characters here have to face some kind of patriarchal domination is what brings them together again Roy has made a parallel between the Dalit Belutha and the women character of the novel to indicate their shared experience at the marginalized class devoid of any practical power to take decision. So just like Subaltern, uh, if I can uh, dare to say a point about it, that they have been marginalized, right? So women as the weaker sex has, has been uh, like treated as the weaker sex has always faced this, have always faced this marginalization. We find Amu falling in love with Beluta, an untouchable Padavan. However, baby Kochamma's own experience made her adverse to the idea of a romantic relationship. At last, Amu has to give up on her love and Beluta has to die to conform to the social norms of love. A shocking, incestuous encounter takes place between the two twins, Esther and Rahil, at the end of the book. The episode is in juxtaposition to the love of Amu and Beluta, and it attributes a certain autonomy on Rahil, which her mother didn't have. So here, Amu, Amu's daughter is Rahil. So where we found that Amu uh, tried, uh, as far as uh, Kochiyama is uh, concerned, Kochiyama tried tried to love someone but failed and never did, uh, dared to venture out again. In case of Amu, he, uh, she fell in love. She left her husband with uh, conviction and with her two children and tried, dared to love again. But in case of Rahil, we see that she is sharing her grief in the way that she likes. She is uh, autonomy. She is using her autonomy to exert her power at least on her own body, if in uh, nowhere else. So female characters are dubbed with all the human qualities like jealousy and pettiness, but shares similar loss of autonomy. So here we see that the characters are neither angel of the house nor femme fatale, rather human. Amos uh, pursue independence and autonomy while being aware of her own sexuality. So here are some uh, points where we see that Amu is talking about her own body. She is feeling her body. She is touching her breasts. And this again shows her uh, uh, that the notion that women are not sexually aware, they don't need sexuality is subverted here. No damsel in distress, rather women as maker of destiny, the Pakistani bride. So now let's focus to uh, another masterpiece, that is the Pakistani bride. So here Zatun escapes from the brutal and harsh tribal society of Koshitan into which she had been married. So Zatun is in fact a child of partition. She was bought by Kwazim in Lahore, but soon her uh, marriage was uh, <clears throat> 
fixed. Miriam, uh, which is uh, evidently Kuzim's uh, wife, warns her, him that the gulf of uh, difference between the life at, in hills and the city life. Her husband treats his wife as a sex object. Zaitun again proceeds in the cold and malevolent area. So she decides to leave her husband when uh, the tortures are uh, uh, like you know, up to the mark. Like she cannot face any more torture. After a week, she reaches the river almost half dead still she has she gained hope as her freedom seems to be calling her from the outside of the river but unfortunately she is raped by two strangers on the banks so robert ross stated that this novel deals specifically about patriarchy and the tradition governing the male female relationship what is so special about pakistani wife here we see women redefining boundaries by venturing out in physically challenging journeys. So here we can say, if I dare to say that Zaitun is somewhere a female Ulysses, right? Because even in case of uh, emotional and moral uh, boundaries, people used to think that women are like strong. Like if it is a mental crisis, women will be uh, there. But here, Zaitun proves that in case of physical journey also, she can be a Ulysses. Zaitun's odyssey from the plains to the snow mountains and back to the plain is symbolic of the inner journey of the young women from the fantasy world of love, romance, and heroes to the harsh and hostile realities of life where man is the hunter and exploiter. Cruel and inhuman treating women like animals. Indira Bhatt said this about this beautiful work, The Pakistani Bride. Now, uh, I have already uh, came to the last part of my work, that is redefining gender roles in Ministry of Atmos Heaviness. So this is one of the most striking work that questioned patriarchy like <clears throat> more than anything else. Pardon me. Ah. More than anything else. The story begins with Anjum, a Muslim transgender woman who was born into sex and named Aftaf. He was initially raised as a boy. Uh, once Aftaf enters adolescence, however, he rejects his male identity and joins the Kawak or House of Dreams, a local community of Hijras, taking the name Anjum. Sanjum so claims for identity of an ordinary woman and not that of a mere entertainer or sex worker. Her dream of becoming a woman manifests itself as she embraces her motherhood, adopting an abandoned toddler named Zana. Along with her uh, being ostracized for not adhering to a particular gender, she also fell sorry, she also fell victim to the violent attacks of a rioting Hindu nationalist group in Gujarat. The experience leaves a traumatized all through her life, yet she always asserted her identity as a woman and as a woman and did her best uh, to achieve that. So here, what is the speciality here? Here, motherhood, not essentially a biological construction, but rather a matter of choice. This is what we can came, come up with. So redefining motherhood. In the one hand, we find a character who is biologically incapable to conceive, becoming a mother. While another woman, Tilo, here we have another part where Tilo as a character is introduced. She decides to give up on her child, I mean abort her child, as she was unwilling to become a mother despite being biologically able to conceive. Thus, the writer has portrayed... Uh, <clears throat> portrayed characters that subverted the uh, gender rules and asserted that women themselves can only decide which role they want to take on in a particular social structure. So it is not always essential that just because you are biologically female, you have to adhere to your gender role. You have to be a mother. Similarly, just because you lack the biological uh, needs which is uh, needed to conceive, then you cannot be a mother. Gender is fluid. And one can, it, it's its a social construct. So you can change your construct according to your own preference or how you feel, simply feel. So in conclusion, I can say that gender roles can be subverted and redefined. There is no gender identity behind the expression of gender identity. It's performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its result, as Butler said. And then again, And then again, the story shows nuances of sexuality and the stories justifies the idea that women are treated as the other, which Simone de Vivier attributed on the female gender. She has, she said, we can always see that here most of the time in Pakistani wife or also women are treated as like property, like in pa 
Pakistani wife, we see that her father, uh, the protagonist's father, is considering, like, uh, uh, is finding someone to sell her daughter because uh, of money, because of money, as if they own their daughter, as if it is property to be bought and sold. The work also shows how women in solidarity or in enmity shares the similar experiences as they